first thing that I would like to say is thank you all for coming. I am so pleased to see uh, so many community members. We've got lawyers from different ministries who are here, and we also have a lot of students, including members of our Indigenous Law Students Association. So thank you very much for making time for this today. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the sacred land on which the University of Toronto operates. It's been the site of human activity for over 15,000 years. This land is the territory of the Huron Wendat and Patoon First Nations, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of New Credit. While it is not the traditional territory of the Métis Nation of Ontario or any Métis group, certainly our people, and I count myself as a Métis person, um, our people used this land, and President Crow is going to speak a little bit about that. The territory was the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which was an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and the Confederacy of Ojibwe and Allied Indians to peaceably share this land and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Today, the meeting place, Toronto is the meeting place, is a meeting place and still home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island. We're grateful to have the opportunity to work on this territory. Um, I don't know if I said this already. I'm Amanda Carling, and I'm the manager of the Indigenous Initiatives, and I organized this event. Uh, I also am a graduate of this law school. I went here from 2009 until 2012, and I just came back in September of last year um, into this role as managing the Indigenous Initiatives. And uh, one of the many ideas that I have is to try to bring more community members in to interact with our students and network with our students and just build relationships in good ways. So that is why one of the many reasons I'm glad that you all came today. Um, and I have the great honor of introducing not only um, an amazing lawyer and educator and the president of the Métis Nation of Ontario, but a good friend of mine. So I'm really grateful that I have this opportunity. Um, elected in May 2016, Margaret Fro is the first woman to serve as the president for the Métis Nation of Ontario. She lives in Barrie, Ontario, within the traditional territory of the historic Georgian Bay Métis community. Margaret is a lawyer and an educator. Prior to being elected president, she served as in-house legal counsel and associate chief operating officer for the Métis Nation of Ontario. She has guest lectured in a variety of settings, has taught as adjunct faculty here at the University of Toronto Faculty of Law, and she's a faculty member at the Banff Centre, teaching in the areas of Indigenous governance, leadership, and management. As MNO president, Margaret leads the government of the Métis Nation of Ontario, the home of the watershed Métis rights decision of uh, the Queen and Powley. The Métis Nation of Ontario represents over 1,800 citizens, seven regional Section 35 rights-bearing historic Métis communities, and she'll talk a little bit more about what that means, and 29 local communities across the province through representatives elected at the local, regional, and provincial level. The Métis Nation of Ontario has demonstrated success in its distinct form of Métis governance, which was recently recognized by Ontario with the first Métis-specific legislation in Ontario the Métis Nation of Ontario Secretary Act, 2015, which might not sound that interesting, but it's a pretty epic, <laughs> epic accomplishment. Uh, and in the federal 2016 Special Ministerial Report, a matter of national and constitutional import, Report of the Minister's Special Representative on Reconciliation with the Métis, Section 35, Métis Rights, and the Manitoba Métis Federation de Decision, which is also known as the Isaac Report, for reasons that I don't need to explain. Margaret is the former president of the Indigenous Bar Association in Canada, the national nonprofit association representing Métis, First Nations, and Inuit lawyers, judges, law professors, and students. She's the former chair of the IBA's Law Student Scholarship Foundation, and a longtime board member and president of Aboriginal Legal Services, formerly of Toronto. She served over eight years as part of the in-house legal counsel group for the Chippewas of Rama First Nation before joining the Métis Nation of Ontario's senior management team in 2013. Margaret has been appointed to various committees and advisory groups focusing on access to justice for Indigenous peoples in Ontario. In 2013, she was appointed to the province of Ontario by the province of Ontario to the Dewaywin Jury Review Implementation Committee, 
the committee tasked with overseeing Ontario's implementation of the 2013 report issued by former Supreme Court of Canada Justice Frankie Iacobucci regarding the lack of First Nations representation on the Ontario juries. There's also no shorter way of saying that. <laughs> I'm trying. Uh, in, September, yeah, yeah. <laughs> in September 2014, she was also appointed to Ontario's Indigenous Justice Advisory Group, or the IJAG, that advises the Attorney General on Indigenous justice issues. And the IJAG is actually uh, meeting here on Monday of next week, so the Indigenous law students will have an opportunity to have lunch with that group of people. In 2017, Margaret was appointed the co-chair of that committee, the IJ. Um, this is, believe it or not, a very short um, overview of the amazing work that Margaret has done. Uh, I have had the great pleasure to work with her as a committee member at Dubwaywin. Um, while we didn't have any overlap, I um, am in, I'm one of the people who has the pleasure of sitting on the board of directors at Aboriginal Legal Services, and she worked with that organization. Um, and she's a mentor and a very good friend. So please help me welcome President Clark. Um, the last thing I forgot to mention is, for those of you who uh, are interested, there is a special Hancock lecture that is coming up next week on Tuesday, which is February 7th, which is the same day that Phil Fontaine is speaking here at lunch, which is another um, event that's open to the public. So if you wanted to make a day out of Indigenous issues at the University of Toronto, you could come to Phil Fontaine's lunch, which is from 12.30 until 2 o'clock, and you can register for by emailing me. And then in the evening, over at Hart House, the Hancock Lecture is happening, and Susan Blight, who works out of First Nations House, who is an Indigenous artist um, and teacher, will be talking um, about light, land and life in Takaranto. So there are some flyers for that as well if you're interested. That's it. Thank you. So, Anine, bonjour. Sego? Tansé? Bonjour. Tansé uh, Kiwa. So, how are you? How is everyone doing? Good. So, the last one, the last greeting, Tansé, Tansé Kiwa, that's hello, how are you? This is a greeting in the language of Machif, which is the language of the Metis Nation. So I wanted to start by acknowledging the territory as well. And I think the, um, Amanda spoke to, where is Amanda? There she is, okay. Um, Amanda spoke to the, um, the absence of the Métis Nation in the University of Toronto's formal land acknowledgement. And this is something that is, has anyone been following these conversations in social media? This is something that's actually really important for us to be acknowledging and talking about. And I think, um, this protocol of acknowledging the land that we're on is a really important protocol. It's important to recognize wherever it is that we're going, that we are on land, indigenous people's lands. And that's a really critically important thing. Another really critically important thing is that we're accurate when we're doing that work and we're acknowledging that. So as Amanda pointed out, these lands, as far as the, the research, the historic research that I am aware of, these lands are not part of the traditional territory of the Métis Nation. That being said, our people, Métis people, the Métis Nation, um, were involved, absolutely involved in on these lands historically. Um, and in fact, anytime you see, when, when you think about where our major centers in Canada are located, and then you start to read back and look at history, what you'll find is that those cities, those were the, that was prime real estate. That was the land where the waterways merged. That was the land where commerce was conducted. That was the land where relationships were developed. And not surprisingly, that was the land where the Métis had a really vital role in acting as liaisons, as traders. Um, and so as a result, when you think about some of these really major centers in Canada, like Toronto being a ga the gathering place, actually, that's formally part of its, part of its name, um, there, is, there is absolutely a history of Métis people on this land. And I, I want to acknowledge as well that there's a very vibrant Métis community here in the city of Toronto right now. And in fact, the Toronto York Region Métis Council are always looking for <laughs> interested Métis people to come out and participate in their events. And um, so I want to acknowledge the Toronto York Métis mm -hmm. Council um, and their leadership, President Terribolio, who um, is actually a, a PhD student here at the University of Toronto in, at OISE. Um, so there's a really vibrant Métis community here in Toronto. There's an extremely vibrant um, and very rich um, 
Métis nation within Ontario, there's an awful lot of information. I can't go into even a, uh, I'll scratch the surface today, but there's a lot of information that's available to you through our website, the Métis Nation of Ontario's website, which is métisnation.org. Um, and there's uh, some of the things that I'll be referring to today. Uh, I would encourage you, if you have interest about the Métis Nation, uh, who we are, Métis rights, there's a lot of information that you can look for online. There's information, you, you in fact, you've got a member of your um, faculty here today who's a very strong Métis from Red River Territory. Um, there's lots of information for you to gather. So uh, I, that's really, it's an invitation for you to learn more about the Métis. And in that sense, um, and that brings me back to the acknowledgement. This is part of the work that as Métis people we are doing constantly. Everywhere that we go, we are telling our story. And that is, that's really important. It's in some senses, um, and for all, I think for all Indigenous people, I, I, I actually had mentioned to a couple of my professors who are in the room today, that I walked into this room and had a little bit of a, a wow, because I did, I'm sure I did civil procedure in this room, and I think I did torts in this room. <laughs> And while the rest of the building, this is my first time in the new, in the new building, while the rest of the building, it was a, wow, this is completely different. I walked in this room and I, I was transported in time. <laughs> so I, forgive me if I start to twitch. Um, that's, just, that's just remembering my law school experience. But I'm thinking about my law school experience and being one of the few Indigenous people in the room and having that experience where when topics come up, being asked, well, what, what, do, what do all Aboriginal people think about that, Margaret? <laughs> Um, and, and of course, the question is absolutely ridiculous, um, and yet as Indigenous people, we're constantly put in that position where we're educating. And I can say that as a Métis person, that responsibility is twofold, because we, our history as Métis people is a history of exclusion. Our history as Métis people is a history of being made invisible. And so I believe that we are right now at a time within our history as Métis people, at a time where Finally, it's like the clouds are parting and the, the sun is shining down on us and it is a beautiful, beautiful time to be Métis in this country today. And I'm going to touch on why some of those things are. Part of it is just because we're awesome. Um, <laughs> but a big part of it is because we're, we're finally coming into a time now where there's greater recognition and understanding and awareness about who we, who we are. And that really, that has to be grounded on our history, it has to be grounded on our stories, it has to be grounded on the, the fact of who we are as a people, who, how we came to be as a people. And so when we talk about things like land, acknowledg land acknowledgements, which is so important, we need to make sure and we need to be insisting that when we're doing that work, we're doing it accurately and that we are paying attention to and showing respect to the Indigenous peoples on the, of, of whose the lands that we're on. Um, and I think in a place like Toronto, I think it's also really important to acknowledge contemporary communities. And Toronto has a very large and, and very strong Aboriginal or Indigenous community um, that is extremely diverse. So I lived here, I moved, so I'm a little bit about me. Um, I am Métis or Machif from the Kapal Valley in Saskatchewan. My mom is actually, her maiden name is Marchand. And so my family are linked to the Red River Territory. And if you go back a little further, up in the Peace River Territory in Alberta. And so I moved from a very small place in Saskatchewan to Toronto in order to go to law school in 1993, which was approximately 2,000 years ago. <laughs> um, I picked Toronto because my partner was living here at the time. Uh, and that was a very selfish move for me. I had, there was no lawyers in my family, no history of, of lawyers or connection with lawyers at all. And so I just knew I wanted to be in Toronto. So I made applications to Osgoode Hall Law School and the University of Toronto. And I was accepted into both. And I was put in the position where I had to make a choice. And it was interesting because I, I thought about it and I thought, well, I'd read about Osgoode in McLean's magazine and it was kind of a big thing. Um, and it was, uh, seemed, sounded like it was sort of a, a mucky muck kind of a law school. U of T was right downtown. It was in the community. It was close to um, the Native Canadian Centre. It was close to where my, where in fact I came and I lived with my oldest brother at the time for that first year. And so I decided that University of Toronto seemed to be a little bit more about the people and um, I would go there instead of Osgoode. I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. Um, <laughs> And in fact, I asked a friend of mine who was at the time teaching at, at Western, um, he was one of my profs in the pre-law program, 
uh, for Native students, which is operated out of the University of Saskatchewan. I have to decide between Osgood and U of T, I'm having a really hard time. And he, he was explaining to me, well, you're going to have to make your own decision. When I told him I thought I was going to U of T law, he said to me, it's a navy blazer, it's a navy blazer, gray flannel pant kind of place. <laughs> Keep in mind, I'm from, you know, a very small place in rural Saskatchewan. I had no idea what he talked and was talking about. I thought, okay, some sort of a dress code. Um, I don't have any either of those items, but I'm sure I could purchase them. Uh, and so I made my choice. I came. Um, I, in fact, I showed up in, in the Bennett Lecture Theater, and our dean came and, and stood and greeted us, and he was wearing, come on, you know. <laughs> a navy blazer and gray flannel pants. And I, I thought, okay, well, I guess Bruce was right. Um, so I have to say that my experience at U of T Law School um, was a very mixed one. Um, it was incredibly fabulous in that when I entered first year law school, there were 15 indigenous law students in my class. And half of those were people that I had actually spent the whole summer with through the pre-law program. So when I walked in on day one, there was a half a dozen other people that I knew and that I'd actually slogged through a really hard program with and I'd had some connections with. And the other thing that I did as I, when I, I of course, between the pre-law program and starting law school, I had moments of crisis where I thought, can I use inappropriate language in this talk? Um, I, I thank you. Actually, in practice, we call swear words legal language, but. <laughs> Um, I thought, what the hell am I doing? Like, why am I doing this? I, I had no frame of reference for law school or law, or the practice of law or anything. Um, but I kept thinking to myself, if I am here, there's got to be other people like me that are going to be here. And so on my very first day, I decided I'm going to seek those people out. And I was really blessed in my first year small group to meet a, a small, like a few, a few people that I totally connected with. It didn't hurt that one of them actually was a doppelganger for my sister. Um, and in fact, her name is Reem Body, and she's a professor now at the University of, of Windsor um, Faculty of Law. Um, but I was really lucky, I was really blessed to find a small group of people that I really connected with, that I, I felt comfortable with, and I had the group that I had gone to, to the summer program with, and then I met the rest of the Indigenous Law Students Association. And we were over 30 strong within the school. We literally doubled the population of the Indigenous students with our first year class. And that group was basically family. Um, we literally laughed together, we cried together, we fought, <laughs> we made up. Um, but it was, um, I had a, an incredible amount of support. And in fact, when it came to our first year exams, I, I still remember um, being in the library and there was a fast and furious, how, how's everybody doing? Do you have this summary? Do you have this summary? Um, and at one point, I had to literally crack open um, a textbook for the first time for the Christmas exams um, on something. And, and my colleagues were just shaking their heads. And everyone is stressed out for each other. And, and we had each other's backs. We took care of each other. And that, in fact, was my experience through the entire three years of law school. Um, I had a, a family. And I had a lot of support. And I think I'm. I hope that I'm giving comfort to those of you that are about to enter law school. Um, so when people ask me, wow, what was it like going to U of T law school? It must have been brutal. Um, I was able to say, actually, I had a lot of support. Now, that being said, I had support because there were supports in place for me. And so this is one of the things that I wanted to mention to Amanda and the members of faculty here. We need to make sure that we are supporting our students as they head into these educational institutions. We may need to make sure that we're creating safe spaces for them. We need to make sure that we're creating culturally welcoming spaces. And that includes things like the land acknowledgement. That includes things like, you know, when we're using language like Indigenous, that we don't just mean First Nations. And oftentimes that's in fact how that language is being used. We need to be, in the same way that when we, see, when we say First Nations, we need to be specific. We need to be respectful of our identity as Indigenous peoples. So um, creating that space for Métis, creating that space for Métis for First Nations and for Inuit is so important. But creating that space for Métis is critically important because that is, that is one of the things that we constantly have to deal with and challenge um, as Métis people. And if you don't believe me, ask any of them that are in the room and they're going to tell you the exact same thing. So a lot of what I do 
Um, whether it's literally yesterday, I was in a very beautiful meeting room sitting underneath the picture of the Fathers of Confederation meeting with key cabinet ministers, and I was basically having the exact same conversation that I'm having with you here now. So whether it's in a, a law school or speaking in front of the prime minister and cabinet ministers or um, in any community setting, this kind of work about telling the story about who we are as Métis people is something that we are constantly engaged in. So that's the... That's a little bit about why I'm here. Uh, well, I'm actually here because Amanda asked me. <laughs> and, um, and as she said, she's a, she's a very dear friend of mine. So, um, and, I'm, and this is um, home for me as well. So um, with that, I want to say uh, I'm glad that everyone showed up. This is a great turnout. Um, I hope you are finished your pizza and won't be throwing it at me um, <laughs> during the course of our conversation. I'll try um, not to create the incentive for you to throw things at me. Um, and I'll start that off by saying I've, I'm coming bearing gifts. So um, this, is, this is part of an Indigenous tradition, and part of it, so that you know, is so that people don't throw things at you. So um, I'm just joking. But I did bring a few things, I, and I hope that there's enough to make it through the room. But I brought some little pins. These are pins of the flag of the Métis Nation. Um, and so these are, if you want to just, Peter, if you could take one and pass it along. Sure, um, and if you don't get one, then let Amanda know and we'll make sure that you get some. Um, now this is, this is a, a gift that, you know, isn't perhaps quite as exciting, but um, it's a copy of uh, the Métis Voyageur, which is the newspaper of the Métis Nation of Ontario. And I'm afraid to say, and quite embarrassed to say, that um, I hadn't really thought of this at the point when I ran for president. Um, it's literally covered with pictures of me. So I apologize for that. Um, but it is, our, it is our, uh, a key communication tool that we have to, to communicate with our citizens. So um, this isn't shameless self-promotion. There are other people that tell me it's important to do. So <laughs> there's that. Um, and then another thing that I'm just going to pass around, I've only got a few here, but I'm just going to sort of pass them around. Um, you can peruse it. And this is the... This, in a way, is kind of stupid for me, having taught for about a decade now. Um, the more stuff I give you to have in your hands while we're talking, it probably creates an opportunity for distraction. So, um, but you know what? I think we can handle that. And I'll try and be as engaging as I can so you don't get lost in publications. But um, one thing that I am sort of passing around for you to take a look at is a report um, that was done by a fellow by the name of Tom Isaac. And this is one of the things that I want to talk to you about today. Tom Isaac has literally written the book on Aboriginal law in Canada, as in he has a book called Aboriginal <laughs> Law in Canada. Um, and he's a very, very well-respected Aboriginal law practitioner, um, obviously, if he's at the point where there's companies that are hiring him to write a book. They have to believe that someone's going to buy it. So he has, he has respect. He's a, a completely legitimate fellow. Um, he was actually tasked um, as a special ministerial representative to the Minister of Indigenous and Northern Affairs to really look at reconciliation of Métis rights, Section 35 Métis rights in Canada. So what I've just passed a couple of copies around, and they'll make their way through the room, is a report called A Matter of National and Constitutional Import. Um, and it essentially, that's the short version. I'm not going to give the long one. You can look at it. You can write it down. Um, these are available online as well. But essentially what it does is it, it tells you some of the history of the Métis, um, the Métis Nation. It tells you um, about Métis rights, and it, and it essentially, through 17 recommendations, sets a, a bit of a roadmap on how Canada should be moving forward with regard to reconciliation of Métis rights. So can I ask, of the people in the room, how many of you are law students? <coughs> okay. And how many of those law students are in their first year? Awesome. Have you guys been talking about Section 35 of the Constitution yet? Okay. Is this fresh? It's okay. All right. Because in some schools you don't get it till quite a bit later, and the faculty, the the curriculum itself changes from place to place. Um, okay. So I am working on the assumption then that there's sort of some understanding or awareness, but probably somewhat limited about uh, Métis and the Métis Nation. So I'm going to give you a little bit, um, a little bit of background, and then I'm hoping that we'll have. Um, I'm going to leave a good chunk of time for us to have questions. How's that? Because I, I could easily talk to use up the rest of the time. But um, I'm going to try and leave some time for questions. And um, ha do I have any yet? <coughs> OK, quiet crowd. I may, this may become participatory. So 
Yes, excellent. That's an excellent question. Does, it, do, does anyone in the room want to answer that? So the flag is, the, this flag, the one that you have in your hand, is actually the oldest flag in the country of Canada. It was first um, unveiled um, in battle, actually, uh, 200 years ago, last summer, at the Battle of Seven Oaks. When the Métis came out together, identifying themselves as Métis, and they took a stand. They took a stand um, with regard to the law around um, trade within this country. Um, they're, they're in the history, and this is in Manitoba, uh, basically there was, a, there was a bit of a showdown that happened. Um, Métis came out in numbers and um, there was a, then described as a massacre, now identified as a battle, um, this flag was flown. So it was also at around the same time it was flown here in Ontario up in the Fort William area. As has been taught to me, the infinity symbol represents essentially the enduring nature of our identity as Métis people. Um, it also, I think, identifies this notion of a combining of, of ancestry um, in terms of identity. And it's all against the backdrop. This pin is blue, but you'll see different flags of different colors. And it's interesting because uh, people have said different, had different ideas about why, why there are red flags, why there are blue flags. Um, so you, you may, this one's blue, but you may have seen the exact same flag with red. Some people were saying, well, one was aligned with one fur trade company and the other was with another. Uh, and just recently I had the chance to hear Jean Taye, who um, was actually one of my colleagues here at the law school, talk on this. And then the research that she's done, because she's been commissioned to write a book on the history of the Métis Nation. Um, and the history that she's done, she's basically determined that the color, the backdrop of the flag was really the color of the fabric that they had in the store at the HBC Trading Post <laughs> at the time. And I'm not kidding, I'm serious. Um, at the time that the flags were made. And so you do see some variation in terms of what that flag looks like, but the main symbol being the infinity symbol is consistent. And there are a few other flags that you will see in different parts of the country that Métis have, have used. And of course, in terms of contemporary, there are other flags as well. But this one is one that all, all all of the Métis Nation identify with this infinity symbol flag. Um, one of the things that she had said was that we're just darn lucky that um, in some of those sort of heavily Scottish areas that there, there weren't flags with the plaid, the tartan in the background. <laughs> so this is, um, and this is all part of our story as Métis people. Um, so I'm going to start actually, let, let's back up a little bit more in terms of, because I'm, this being in this room really is bringing me back. Um, to the fall of 1993. <laughs> One of the things that I was really, part of the reason that I, I had such a great experience here with the, well, the reason I had such a great experience here were the people that I had a chance to get to know. And so one of the, one of the people that became a very, very dear friend of mine was a third year student by the name of Jean Taye. Is there anyone in the room that doesn't know who Jean Taye is? Good for you for having the guts to put your hands up. <laughs> Um, Jean is, so Jean is also a graduate, she was two years ahead of me in law school here, and Jean is um, widely regarded as um, an expert internationally with regard to Aboriginal law, um, but Métis in particular. She's also the great, great grandniece of Louis Riel, so she's a member of the Riel family. And she has um, had, in fact even before she came to law school, she'd had a very vibrant career as a dancer. And, uh, and as an artist, and then she ended up in law. So you think, I was thinking, do I belong here? I'm sure she had those moments too, heading into first year. But she has, um, she has uh, devoted her practice to Aboriginal law, and her practice um, in particular has a focus on Métis rights, but she's, she's still practicing. She's partially sort of stepped back from the practice of law now to write. Uh, but she is still working as a lead negotiator for the Stolo Nation. So she's done a lot of uh, First Nation self-government negotiations. She's done a lot of litigation. And she has led, um, along with her partners, including Jason Madden, who's not a grad from this school, but sorry about that. Um, they really are recognized as the leading Métis rights um, and a leading Aboriginal law firm in Canada. So I'd ask you all now to mute your telephones. <laughs> Sorry about that. So in my first year in 1993, Jean was telling me about this really neat, so she was working during law school as a student at a firm called Pape Salter, 
um, which was just up the road on Prince Arthur. And um, she was telling me about this really neat case that she was working on called Pally. And um, all through law school, I was hearing about Pally. Um, and in fact, um, even my best friend who started working at the firm was also working on the Pally case. And for those of you that aren't familiar with it, the Pally case was actually the first time that the Supreme Court of Canada articulated, gave meaning to Métis rights under Section 35 of the Constitution Act. So um, the other thing that was happening around that same time, she was also telling me about these really interesting conversations that were happening to form the Métis Nation of Ontario. And this stuff was literally happening because her apartment was just on DuPont, just off of university, literally happening in her backyard. Um, that people had been sitting and talking about coming together under, under one banner, under the, uh, as one nation of people, as Métis people in Ontario, and under a new entity called the Métis Nation of Ontario. So that's around the time, 1993 was actually the time that the Métis Nation of Ontario was established, formally established. Though I can say that as Métis people and as the Métis Nation, um, it has existed um, obviously for much longer than that. But in 1993, um, Métis people in Ontario came together and chose to establish a new entity, a Métis-specific entity, whose job would be to really focus on, on, on advancing Métis and Métis rights within the province of Ontario. And that new entity is the Métis Nation of Ontario. Um, we also, at the same time, created um, a legal and administrative arm called the Métis Nation of Ontario Secretariat. So the Secretariat basically does the work of the Métis Nation. The Métis Nation of Ontario are the people. It is all of us as citizens. We are the Métis Nation of Ontario. So all of this was happening, um, and I had stayed well clear of Métis politics, having come from Saskatchewan. Those of you in the room that understand what that means will know um, that um, I actually had wanted nothing at all to do with it. So I, um, I listened intently to what Jean was telling me and sort of followed it along the line, but wasn't directly involved with it. Um, over the years, I came to realize that the Métis Nation of Ontario was actually a really strong, vibrant, healthy um, community of Métis all across the province that had really, really good, clear goals about where they wanted to be and were really good at, at getting there. And in fact, the Métis Nation of Ontario is a, has been recognized widely as a leader, both as a Métis government, but also as a, as a leader in terms of advancing Métis rights in Canada. And so that, that interesting case that she was working on in my first year, the Pally case, that became the watershed decision um, for Métis rights. And in fact, it's still the law in Canada in terms of identifying um, how a, a Métis community um, is to be identified and the test that they're meet to meet in terms of proving uh, a right under Section 35 of the Constitution Act. So that Pally decision was, uh, that was a case that was led um, by the Métis Nation of Ontario, along with um, a family, the Pally family, and the community, the historic Métis community in the Sault Ste. Marie area. Um, and it has meant, it has literally changed the world for Métis people across Canada. Um, and I think it has been of benefit to other First Nations people as well. But that Pally decision, um, it took us, well, one of the interesting things, so yesterday, I was, as I mentioned, I was in, in uh, Ottawa. I was on Parliament Hill and we were having this meeting. It was supposed to be um, the first ever Crown and Métis Nation Summit with the Prime Minister of Canada. This is part of what he announced when he met with uh, the National Indigenous Leaders in December, on December 15th. Unfortunately, the Prime Minister wasn't able to be there yesterday. Um, the shooting in Quebec and the aftermath of that um, pulled him away. And as a result, instead, Métis Nation leaders met with some key cabinet ministers and we had a chance to talk about hate and intolerance. We had a chance to, we, we spent some time in silence thinking about the families and communities that have been impacted by the shooting in Quebec City. But we had the time to really um, talk about and share with some of these members of cabinet who we are as a Métis people and what some of our challenges have been and to talk about the relationship that we want to have moving forward. Pali um, continues to be a driving force in terms of the recognition of Métis in Canada. But there have been other developments since then, so and that Pali case was in 2003, um, that have helped to sort of frame how it is that we're moving forward um, as, Métis, as the Métis nation in terms of articulating our rights and, and advancing those. But one of the really interesting things about yesterday and being on Parliament Hill is that 
Uh, and this wasn't intentional because we didn't set the date. The Prime Minister set the date for the, the summit that, that didn't, ar didn't actually happen yesterday. January 30th of 1981, so yesterday, 36 years ago yesterday, was the date that uh, Métis were, were included in the draft language of what was to become Section 35 of the Constitution Act of 1982. So it was on January 30th in 1981 that there was finally agreement that Métis would be included. Mét the Mét Métis peoples of Canada would be included as one of the Aboriginal peoples of Canada. And so it's all of these anniversaries. Um, it's also, unfortunately, right around this time is the anniversary um, of the, sh the shooting in Lalash, which is a, a Métis community in Saskatchewan. Lots of anniversaries. Um, yesterday was a really emotional day for a lot of people as we had these conversations. So, so you think about January 30th, 1981, finally the Constitution is repatriated, 1982, and it's not until 2003 before there's a formal articulation by the Supreme Court about what that means. What, what does the inclusion of Métis peoples mean in Section 35 of the Constitution Act? <laughs> And so it's been, um, it's been a slow burn in terms of the development of Métis rights jurisprudence in Canada. But I can tell you that um, things have been happening really quickly since then. And really quickly in particular over the course of the last few years. There's been a lot of developments. So, so I get ahead of myself. So Métis, is there anyone in the room that's not familiar with who the Métis nation is? See, no one's going to put up their hands now. <laughs> That's okay, I don't blame you. Um, so there's a lot of conversation right now in Canada about Indigenous people. There's a lot of conversation right now in Canada about, um, in particular, since the Daniels decision, around who are the Métis. And so you're going to hear a lot of different perspectives on that. But I can tell you, um, in terms of my identity, and the Métis Nation of Ontario, which I had, and, and we are part of the Métis Nation um, across um, Canada, across the Métis Nation homeland, which is Ontario westward. We believe that the Métis Nation is a distinct Aboriginal peoples. I shouldn't say we believe. We, the Métis Nation is a distinct Aboriginal peoples of Canada with a distinct identity, culture, language, um, and a history of being on the land prior to Canada being Canada prior to Ontario being Ontario. We are a people that have emerged as a result of the mixing of both First Nations and European ancestry. There are some people that will tell you that nine months after the first European arrived on the shores of Canada, the first Métis <laughs> came to be. Now that's working on the assumption that people were getting busy early and um, but it, it's actually, that notion is a really, really, it's false um, and it's really problematic. It's actually quite insulting for Métis people. Because Métis aren't simply a mixing of two races. Métis people um, emerged, literally emerged through this process of ethnogenesis out of not just the mixing, but of several generations of people that had both European and First Nations ancestry several generations having the opportunity to come together to form a distinct identity, a distinct community. In fact, um, the language of Machif is a blend of both European language and First Nations language. And that, I, I remember I was, I was teaching here for a little while as adjunct faculty, and that was one of the things we talked about with the Machif language. Eth, um, linguists apparently are really intrigued by Machif because much like every other thing that we do, as Métis people, we broke all the rules. We, we normally language as it's developed, there's certain patterns and rules that are followed and from, I'm not a linguist, but from what I understand, the Machif language really breaks a lot of those rules and a lot of those patterns. But in, in, in the same way that our, at, as the Machif language was created as a common language of Métis people with different dialects all across the homeland, but a common language, it's, it, I think it's a great metaphor for the emergence of, of our, of our peop, as a peoples, the Métis Nation as a peoples in Canada. So we are not, and we do not purport to re represent people of mixed race ancestry. That is not who we are. We are people that are descendant of Métis communities, historic Métis communities. We are people who, in fact, the, in order to, to be well uh, recognized as a citizen of the Métis Nation, you need to first 
self-identify as Métis, not as First Nations or Inuit, but as Métis, as a distinct identity. You need to be able to show how you are linked, ancestrally linked, to one of those historic Métis communities. And there's also the need for community acceptance. So when we talk about the Métis Nation, what we're talking about are those communities of Métis people that formed and coalesced as a nation of peoples that emerged as a, as a distinct nation of peoples generations after that first contact with Europeans for, and First Nations people. So as Métis, that is why we were recognized under Section 35. We were recognized because we were a distinct, unique nation of peoples that were on the land, practicing our culture, our language, our traditions, on the land, in possession of our territories, and in many places, um, solely in possession of our territories, and many other places, in partnership with First Nations, prior to this place becoming known as Canada, and prior to this province in particular being known as Ontario. That is why we're recognized. It's not because of uh, an ever so great Indian ancestor, First Nation ancestor. It's not because we're mixed. Um, and there's a whole, in fact, the Daniels decision really does start to address some of those issues around those people that have mixed ancestry, um, that have been disconnected from their First Nation communities. That is not who we are as the Métis Nation. We represent the descendants of those historic Métis communities. So that's a really fundamental point to start with. Um, and, and a fundamental point to start with in terms of our recognition under Section 35. So we have, within Ontario, we have several regional rights-bearing communities. So these are communities um, that have been identified as being present on the land in possession of those territories prior to Ontario being Ontario, prior to Canada becoming Canada. And those are the communities that the Métis Nation of Ontario represents, as well as those many other Métis who have come here from other places. And I would be one of those Métis that have come here from other places. So when we talk about those historic rights-bearing communities, I would be a member of historic rights-bearing community in the Red River area, as would Amanda. Anna? Yes. So as Métis, we have come here from other places. Where? Um, well, via North Balfour. Yeah. So many Métis have ended up in Ontario, but we're not actually from those historic rights-bearing communities in Ontario. And the Métis Nation of Ontario represents those Métis citizens as well. So that's who we are as the Métis Nation of Ontario. We have over 19,000 adults that are registered in our citizenship uh, registry. Um, this is um, an independent, objectively verified citizenship registry. It's actually the heart of our identity as the Métis Nation. And so these are all people who have said, I have stood, stand to say, I am a Métis person. Here's how I connect to those historic Métis communities and that they are accepted by, by the Métis community. Those are the people that we represent. Um, and those, again, are adults and our numbers are growing. Um, there's an awful lot of Métis that haven't, and I would take this opportunity to chastise those in the room that haven't yet made their application for MNO citizenship. <laughs> Amanda. Um, <laughs> But that number, is a, that number certainly doesn't represent the number of Section 35 rights-bearing Métis, like Métis nation citizens um, within the province of Ontario. That number is a very conservative number, but it is growing. We have um, six regional rights-bearing communities located around the province. And when you look at the map, really, and again, this comes back to our history as a peoples, our communities were, were really sort of not sort of, our communities evolved and came to be around these fur trade posts, around the forts, all along the waterways, because that's where our people were. So um, you look on our map and our communities hug the, around the Great Lakes. They go up into the northwest corner of Ontario. They go up towards James Bay. And those communities are really descendant of the Métis um, that were formed, Métis Nation citizens, the, the Métis that came to be in the James Bay area. They're more situated a little further south now. And then down into the Georgian Bay area as well. And then we have other citizens as well that go really all along St. Lawrence and down all the way to Windsor and all the way up to, to Ottawa. So that is how, where our 
territory within Ontario really spans around the Great Lakes and down into the Georgian Barrier area and then up into the Hudson's Bay area. Um, we have of those, so those are the regional rights bearing communities, we also have 29 um, chartered community councils. So these are councils in communities with a population large enough to have their own Métis local level of governance. And so here in, in Toronto, um, the Toronto York Region Métis Council has a charter. They have, they have been granted the responsibility to represent citizens, our citizens, our nation citizens that are in the Toronto region. We have 29 of those councils located around the province. Our public service, our Métis public service in Ontario is now over 200 employees strong and we have 29 offices um, that are either open or about to be open um, across Ontario. We had 20 up until just recently with a province announced um, the development of a, a family well-being program under their commitments to end violence against Indigenous women and that has given us the opportunity to create family, Métis family well-being positions and offices um, as a result in all 29 of our community council areas. So we have a, a fairly large and growing public service and we have a, a democratically elected governance structure with representatives at the local level, at the regional level, those regional rights bearing communities, as well as at the provincial level. And so as president of the Métis Nation of Ontario, I head the provisional council of the Métis Nation of Ontario, which is our, essentially, it's our provincial government for the Métis. And as I mentioned before, that report that I passed around, um, and I'd really encourage people to pick it up and read it because it's a good primer. It acknowledged the Métis Nation of Ontario as a Métis government and, um, and also acknowledged um, the recognition that has been granted to the Métis Nation as well um, as a result of that. Uh, one of the things that um, Amanda referenced in my introduction was the Métis Nation of Ontario Secretariat Act. And this was essentially Ontario's recognition, and I, sorry Tristan, I'm like tapping the microphone which is not good from a, a video perspective. Um, the Ontario, when we organized that Métis Nation of Ontario Secretariat as our legal and our administrative arm, like our, our opportunity to do business on behalf of our nation, we used the tools that we had available to us, which was Ontario corporate law. I hope it doesn't surprise anyone in the room that when legislators in Ontario developed the Ontario Business Corporations Act that they really didn't have Indigenous self-government in mind. <laughs> And so one of the things that we said instantly was, we're going to use these tools, but these tools don't work for us. They're, it's a very awkward fit. We are taking a square peg and we're trying to jam it into a tiny little square hole. And so for 20, over 20 years, we pushed the Ontario government to say, this, we're using the tool, we're doing the best we can with the tools that have been provided to us, but this is not a good fit for us. It doesn't recognize um, or respect our unique Métis um, governance, our way of doing things, including things like province-wide democratic ballot box, ele box elections, including things like having Métis youth have the active participants in our governance structure. Ontario law, and in particular the, the what someday, uh, there are government lawyers in the room? Show yourself. Um, <laughs> No, I just didn't want to offend anyone, but the Ontario, so Ontario, the Ontario, gov the Ontario legislature has actually passed the Ontario Not-for-Profit Corporations Act. Um, and it's been, um, in terms of its actual implementation, it's, we're going to do it then, well, we're going to do it then, well, we're going to do it then. So it's a shifting target in terms of when it'll actually come into force. But that legislation in particular was going to really put a stranglehold on our governance structure. And so um, finally we had in... Um, to December of 2014, the Premier of Ontario committed to working with the Métis Nation of Ontario to address that and to come up with some sort of a solution. And the solution was, we sat down with government, uh, the government representatives and their lawyers to say, here's all the problems that we have with using your legislative tools. And then we worked together to figure out how do we create space for Métis governance. And the result came to be the Métis Nation of Ontario Secretariat Act. It's not our law, it's Ontario's law. But what it is, is a recognition by Ontario, um, uh, basically creating space. What they've done is they've carved out room for Métis Nation governance within Ontario law. And so that in and of itself, um, as Amanda was saying, it doesn't sound very exciting, but it was a pretty huge thing for us. Um, that recognition by the government of Ontario, and it's in the legislation, recognizing us um, as part of the larger Métis Nation, recognizing our governance structure, um, recognizing that we are, that we 
um, negotiate on behalf of and, and assert rights on behalf of Métis citizens in Ontario was a significant advancement for us. And when it came time for the work that Tom Isaac did in his report um, that, that you saw this morning or this afternoon, um, that was one of the things that he looked to to say the Métis Nation of Ontario is a Métis government. The Métis Nation of Ontario has been recognized as such. And so these are all part of the tools that we are using to advance um, our nation on the path towards a full, um, full expression of self-government. So the Métis Nation of Ontario Secretariat Act is not self-government. The Métis Nation of Ontario Act is a recognition of our government and our unique Métis governance. And it's a stepping stone on our way to what will eventually become, I hope, a Métis Nation uh, piece of legislation that recognizes um, self-government for Métis in Ontario. And that is the direction that we are heading. So there is, um, Amanda wanted me to touch on the Daniels decision and I've referenced it uh, really briefly earlier. And then we're gonna, and then I'm gonna stop so we can, because this really could be a very long conversation that we're gonna have. But I wanna touch on Daniels and then let's open it up for questions so that we can have more back and forth. So the Daniels case was um, a case that was filed um, many years ago by Harry Daniels, who um, a, along with many other things, he's actually referred to as the great Harry Daniels. Um, those, of you that, those of you that may have had a chance to meet him, he was very much a larger than life character, um, a leader, a true leader within the Métis Nation. He was actually from the Regina Beach area, just north of Regina. And he was very much responsible and part of that team and widely recognized as the person who, 36 years ago yesterday, was successful in getting Métis peoples recognized in Section 35 of the Constitution Act. So Harry, along with others um, that were involved um, in a group uh, that was a mixture of, of Métis and non-status Indians in Canada, launched the Daniels case um, in, does anyone know the exact year? I don't have it in front of me. That's a test. Okay, you've all failed. <laughs> I'm trying to remember the year, but it was a very... 1999? Um, and CAP, the Congress of Aboriginal Peoples, have um, helped to push that case forward. There hadn't been Métis Nation involvement in that decision until it got to the higher levels of court. But essentially what the decision, uh, what the case was, was to... Um, seeking declaration that Métis and non-status Indians were, fell under Section 9124 of the Constitution Act. Um, and when we say Section 9124 of the Constitution Act, we're referring to those division of powers provisions in the Constitution where at the, at the time those Fathers of Confederation were trying to decide, okay, think about the, the breadth of matters that will have to be de dealt with within our country, what will fall under federal jurisdiction, what will fall under provincial. 9124 was, 91 was federal, 92 was provincial. And 9124 in particular dealt with Indians and lands reserved for Indians. And so um, in terms of that history that I spoke of earlier, the exclusion of Métis people, Métis and non-status Indians were not identified specifically with regard to having um, falling under federal jurisdiction. And as a result of that, um, there was uh, essentially no relationship with the government of Canada. And so for Métis people, and I can't speak for non-status Indians, but for Métis people, we have literally had 150 years of this. We would go to the province and we would say, these are our concerns, these are our grievances, and they would say, go to the federal government, you're an Aboriginal Peoples of Canada. We would go to the federal government and they would say, go to the province, you're not a First Nations or an Inuit. So you go over there. And in fact, initially they would say, you're not First Nations. And in fact, they wouldn't even say that. You're not Indian, so go over there. The Inuit eventually brought a reference case to the Supreme Court to address this issue in the 30s, and the decision was made very clearly then that Inuit were Indians for the purposes of Section 9124. That didn't negate their identity as Inuit. It was just for the purposes of jurisdiction. They fell under federal jurisdiction. And so it took until the Daniels decision in the Supreme Court that was just issued last year in April, before there was a Supreme Court decision that said finally that Métis, the Métis peoples of Canada, were also included under Section 9124 of the Constitution Act. So that decision really looked at when we said during the division of powers, when the government said Indians and lands reserved for Indians 
who did that include? And what the Supreme Court said in the Daniels decision was, it included all of the Aboriginal peoples. That, that explanation really ties back to the history of Canada. And when at that time in 1867, what were they thinking of when they did that division of powers? And really what they were thinking of is how can we expand Canada? How can we get that railway built? How can we get settlers out onto the land so that we can take Indigenous people's territory? Um, and so as a, as a result, what was intended was the, the need for them to deal with the people that were on the land. And when we're talking about Ontario westward, the people that were on the land, until you get up into the north, were Métis and First Nations. And so in the, in the Supreme Court of Canada decision in Daniels, they recognized that when you look at all of, and this is a complete oversimplification, but when you look at all of the evidence that's before us, when we're trying to put our heads into the minds of those drafters of the Constitution back in the day, what did they mean? That they meant all Aboriginal people. Because without a, re a relationship, without a working relationship with Métis, as well as First Nations, they would never have been able, they would never have been able to succeed with building the rail railroad or expanding um, settlement within Canada. We're, we are a forceful and at times unruly bunch as Métis, and we stand up uh, when we believe things aren't right. And so the, the government needed a relationship with Métis. If there wasn't a relationship, that process would have stopped because we would have stopped it. So that was part of that decision in Daniels, was recognizing that Métis were on the land. Those non-status Indians, those, those people that with First, Na First Nations people, First Nations people that weren't necessarily tied to bands, not, not necessarily tied to treaties, those were, those were the people that were on the land, um, in addition to those First Nations that were already recognized on, as being under federal jurisdiction. So that's what the Daniels decision is all about. The declaration was granted that, uh, that Métis and non-status Indians fall under Section 9124 of the Constitution Act. There were two other declarations that the parties had sought. One was acknowledging that there's a fiduciary duty owed to Métis and non-status Indians. And the court said, we don't actually have to issue that declaration because it's already well settled in law. It also sought um, a declaration that there was a duty on the, on the Crown to negotiate with Métis and non-status. And the, the court in that decision said, uh, similarly, said, we don't have to issue that declaration because it's already well settled in Canadian law. So that's essentially what the outcome of the Daniels decision was, was that for the purposes of figuring out, do the Métis have a relationship or is there, is there jurisdiction, is there legislative jurisdiction by the government of Canada, the federal crown, with respect to the Métis? The answer is yes. What the Daniels decision did not do is to negate our identity as Métis people. It did not say, it did not change the Pali test. It that actually had absolutely nothing to do with Métis rights under Section 35 of the Constitution Act. It simply dealt with the relationship. Who ultimately is responsible for the relationship with the Métis nation in Canada? And it, that the answer coming from the Supreme Court was the federal government. So that's what the Daniels decision was. Now, how was the Daniels decision reported is a totally different thing. Um, and in fact, there are many people that, um, I, you know, I, it's a challenge for me to come out and say really terrible things about the Supreme Court of Canada, but a lot of my friends do. And um, in a really well-educated and well-meaning way, it's, um, that decision has been very much criticized um, for the way it was written and, and for essentially creating more confusion, uh, creating more questions than it, than it answered. But ultimately, when, it, when you boil it down, that's what the dis Daniels decision said. So finally, for us, finally that issue of jurisdiction has been resolved. And so that back and forth, that has now gone. I mean, we're now starting to, uh, there's still some people that will say, you know, you talk to the provincial government, they'll say, well, but then what is our responsibility? And though those responsibilities haven't changed at all. The province still has jurisdiction in those areas that it has jurisdiction. But ultimately, our grievances, ultimately, in res responsibility for our grievances, fall with the federal government. And I think it's going to be when you, in particular, we're not talking, Métis don't have a land base in, Canada, in Ontario. They, there are land bases in Alberta under the Métis Settlements Act. But we live um, in areas, in urban areas and in rural areas, and some in, in really rural, like remote areas, but mostly in the urban and semi-urban um, areas across the province. 
Um, Ontario law, obviously, in Ontario, our relationship with the government of Ontario is something that's really important because it governs um, the vast majority of, of um, what it is that we do. Um, but now with the recognition under the Daniels decision, that door has finally been opened with the federal government to say that that relationship with the federal government, um, that door has to be open, that it can no longer be closed for lack of a recognition of jurisdiction. Now what that's actually going to mean moving down the road is the, the big question, the $60,000 question, that's how old I am. Now those questions are obviously a lot more expensive than $60,000. <laughs> but that question around where do we go from here is really what's on the mind of all of us right now. And so I bring you back again to that report from Tom Isaac and the roadmap that he's laid out in terms of how do we move forward with reconciliation of Métis rights under Section 35. Um, and those specific recommendations that he's made. Really what, what we're doing now is figuring out in terms of, when you look at Daniels and the Isaac report, what are the next steps? And those next steps are things like the commitment that was made by the Prime Minister in December to establish a nation-to-nation, -nation, government government-to-government <coughs> relationship with the Métis Nation, as well as with First Nations, as well as with Inuit. And that's very much what the intent of the, the Plan Summit for yesterday was about, was starting off, was essentially, was establishing a permanent bilateral mechanism between the, the Crown, the Federal Crown, and the Métis Nation. So we're going to be, and you're going to be reading about yesterday, actually last evening, the Métis Nation of Alberta signed a Memorandum of Understanding to Advance Reconciliation with the Government of Canada. Um, last year you would have read about the same thing, signed by the Manitoba Métis Federation. That was part of what Dan Tom Isaac was tasked to do, was talk about how do we implement the Manitoba Métis Federation case. Another big milestone for the Métis Nation, 2013 decision. Um, so you're going to be seeing these memorandums of understanding to advance reconciliation and what those things really mean are a commitment by the Federal Crown to work with the Métis Nation through these exploratory discussion tables to essentially establish a mandate to move forward with negotiating self-government. And that's where, that's where we are today. Um, so, I've touched on maybe an eighth of what it is that I wanted to talk to you about today, um, but I think we should open it up for questions. So, the one thing I would say, we are recording the, the presentation, so if you ask a question, your voice will be recorded. If you want to ask a question and you don't want your voice recorded, you can pass me a note. Don't write anything silly and have me. <laughs> <laughs> And for those of you that haven't, this is a, haven't seen it before, this publication, Métis Law in Canada by Jean Taye, um, is an excellent source with regard to Métis Law. And this is actually Amanda's copy. So there is one here at the faculty. Ilsa, the Indigenous Law Students Association's copy. There you go. I don't want to appropriate it. Um, <laughs> but a really good primer that's constantly updated on Métis Law in Canada. So a great resource. Yes. Uh, do we know when the uh, distinct language came into being and to what extent are there mechanisms underway to keep that language alive? Yeah, uh, well our, our existence as a people here in Ontario is only a couple hundred years old. So Machif came to be at the time that the Métis Nation emerged as distinct people. So that's within the last 200 years in Ontario. Um, there are many different dialects and this is one of, the, one of the things that we are working on within the Métis Nation of Ontario is working on those Ontario specific dialects of Machif. So if you look over in the northwestern part of the province, uh, Métis in that area, the Machif that they speak is very similar to Red River Machif. When you get up towards James Bay, there's slightly different dialects down into the Georgian Bay area, slightly different dialects. So this is work that we're doing. One of the things that, has, that was just announced before Christmas um, was the intent by this government um, to pass an Indigenous Languages Act. Um, what that act will look like is yet to be determined and what they've identified, what they've articulated is that they're going to be working directly with Métis and First Nations and Inuit to talk about what that law should look like. Um, but I know that there has been a commitment by the Federal Minister of Heritage, uh, Minister Jodi, to, um, to commit resources to protect and revitalize Indigenous language. So that's very much part of the work that we're going to be involved in. Thank you. Is there any resources in terms of the historic Métis communities that are in Ontario? Uh, just because I'd like to know more about, um, you know, when I'm going into schools and teaching, like talking about specifically Ontario historic Métis communities, I'd like to have, you know, more information on um, on that. So is there is there a resource 
in, in on the Métis Nation website about his, like specific historic Métis communities or yeah. So don't don't look at Ontario curriculum because you won't find the answers there. No, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but this is something that we actually are actively working on. Okay. Um, are, is telling the story of those regional communities. Um, that's something that we're very much engaged in right now. And those resources as they are prepared, they'll continually, we'll be using the website to promote that, as well as talking with Ontario about the need to, this is a big part of our conversation with Ontario, I just met with the Premier last fall to talk about the need to tell the story of Métis in Ontario. Again, this notion of the, our history being one of exclusion. In Ontario, it seems like we're moving down this road of articulating, in terms of the history of Ontario, articulating this, this concept of we are all treaty people. You're either First Nations who signed treaty or you're settlers who benefited from treaty. But that story, that narrative, doesn't actually tell the story of the Métis Nation in Ontario. And our, our story as Métis people is one, again, of exclusion in terms of the treaty table. Um, there are many, many examples in Ontario where treaty commissioners were sent out into territories to treat with Indigenous peoples. And when the Métis and the First Nations came forward, the First Nations were engaged in the treaty, pro treaty process and Métis were told, sorry, we don't have a mandate to deal with you. You're not under federal jurisdiction. The, you see the real problem with that history that was finally corrected with Daniels. Um, and so Métis were turned away from, from the treaty table. Um, there's one exception to that, and this is a really cool exception. In the northwestern part of Ontario, the half-breeds of Rainy River and Lake they actually signed a half-breed adhesion to Treaty Number 3, two years after Treaty 3 was signed. And that's the only example of Métis, specific Métis treaty in Ontario, and it's, and it's quite unique across the entire country. Um, there, is, there was a system of script in the West, uh, which was another legislated way to essentially remove lands, as the result of it, remove lands from uh, those Métis families. But here in Ontario, the story time and again um, as Métis, and this is another th great thing about Métis, and it's really neat, actually, part of the history of Métis in Ontario, was the prevalence of petitions, where Métis families with it, like Métis communities, would come together and they'd actually write formal petitions to the Crown and send those off. And there are several examples of those um, historic petitions within Ontario, uh, where Métis came forward and said, you need to come and deal with us. You, we need to talk about protecting our lands. Um, there's a great story, actually, that Mitch Case, who's the head of our Youth Council for the Métis Nation of Ontario, tells about the story of his community. So he's actually from the Pali community, so that Métis community up in the Sault Ste. Marie area. And he shared with me a little bit about the history of his community. So it's very similar to the Red River area. The Métis had, um, had lived and created families. They had these lots along the river. Um, so the, you see these river lots that, that all flow off. So they were farms, right? Um, and as um, in the 18, earlier, early to mid-1800s, as there was this encroachment, there were surveyors coming on, there were mining companies coming in, there were settlers coming in on the land. The Métis in that area, along with First Nation leaders, petitioned the Crown to say, these, these extracts, these mining companies are coming here, these settlers co are, are coming here, and we, we need to talk with you about protecting our lands. And of course, the petitions went unanswered. And so this is a really great story. Um, the First Nations and the Métis leaders there at the time, they actually formed an armed party. Uh, this is, I, I, I made a joke earlier about us being unruly. We're actually quite tactical. And, um, <laughs> and they formed an armed party and they actually took over a, a mine. Um, and they, they took over a cannon as well. And um, this, was, this is historically referred to as the, uh, the event at Micah Bay. And as a result of that, that got the government's attention. And so the Crown sent out a treaty commissioner, and that his name was Robinson. And so he came up, and eventually that led to the, the signing of the Robinson-Huron and Robinson-Superior Treaties in 1850. Um, when he came up, even though the First Nations and Métis had petitioned, he came up with a mandate to only deal with the First Nations. And what he said, and it, was, it wasn't just the Métis that were saying, you need to treat with the Métis. The First Nation leader, Shinguakis, was saying, you need to deal with our Métis relatives as well. And of course he didn't, but what he did say is, don't worry, I'll come back. And I tease Mitch about how patient his community is, because that was <laughs> a very long time ago, uh, in 1850, he never returned. But what he did tell the Métis uh, community there was, we'll protect your river lots. So all those Métis families and those farms, those river lots that, uh, along the water, we will protect those. And so there was enough of a commitment, I'll come back and we'll make sure those lands are protected, that the First Nations went ahead and signed a treaty 
Not only did he not protect the lands, there is a, there's a history there of land speculation. Um, and you should look at this. There's a history of land speculation of those people that were, respect, were responsible for scrip and treaty. Um, those lands, the Métis were instead told that they would have the opportunity to buy their farms. <laughs> and isn't this interesting, right? <coughs> we're going to give you the opportunity to buy your land um, that you've worked and that is yours. Um, and so, not surprisingly, over the course of just over a decade, that community, which was well over 200 people strong, was reduced to just three families mm -hmm. because people didn't have a means of income to pay the price to buy their land. And so they ended up scattering and living where they could. Some actually went and lived, uh, went on to reserve and lived in those communities with their relatives. And then they were kicked off because they weren't status Indians. And others settled on crown lands. And that situation continued for a while um, until just after the Second World War where Métis veterans were returning home. They were coming back. Um, the government at the time had decided that some of these lands that the Métis, these villages had relocated to, that that would make a really nice park. And so they informed the Métis that they would have to leave. And Métis didn't. They actually sent government employees out and they burned those homes to the ground. And that story, that story of literally burning Métis out of their homes and off the land is a very common story. And you'll see there, in fact, just last fall, there was a great story, well, it's a very sad story, but the exact same kind of a story out of a community in Manitoba where the government said, we're taking this um, and pushing it off. In fact, in, in the West, the Métis were known as um, the road allowance people because they were continually pushed off and off and off their lands, literally living in the ditches, living on, on bits of crown land that were accessible. So that's part of our history too as Métis people in Ontario. We were excluded from treaty. With the exception of the half-breed adhesion of Treaty 3, we were excluded from treaty. And so all of those kinds of outstanding issues with regard to land, that is, when the Supreme Court of Canada refers to the unfinished business of confederation, those are the things that they're talking about. And when they talk, you know, when they talk the, the title of Tom Isaac's report, a matter of national and constitutional import, that's actually a line from the Manitoba Métis Federation case where the court has said, you, we have to, government, the government of Canada and the, the people of Canada have to reconcile with the Métis nation. This is, this is a matter of constitutional, of national import. And I, I would suggest that until we approach reconciliation as a means to, rec of, and, and there's different, this is a whole other conversation on what does reconciliation mean. There's the TRC reconciliation, there's this notion of reconciliation that a lot of people are really working with, which is almost sort of a soft, I've, I've read a few things, I feel really bad about it. <laughs> there's that soft sort of notion of reconciliation. Then there's reconciliation that the Supreme Court of Canada is talking about, which is there are specific rights identified under Section 35 of the Constitution Act, and we need to settle how it is that Canada and those, uh, and those rights can coexist. Mm -hmm. And so that, that work of reconciliation, that unfinished business of confederation, um, is very much um, the story of the Métis in Canada. And so it's not just about having these conversations and educating and making sure that you know, we're being inclusive when we talk about Indigenous. Are we, are we really talking about Indigenous? Or are we just talking about one particular Indigenous peoples? Um, all the way through to um, looking at government policy, looking at programs and services, all of those things. But I can tell you that, and again, that history of exclusion, when it comes to those land grievances, <coughs> Canada established specific and comprehensive claims policies to guide how it would work with Indigenous peoples to deal with these historic um, and contemporary land grievances. And Métis, the only Indigenous peoples of Canada were ex that, that were excluded from those policies. So those policies are there for First Nations, they are there for Inuit people, and Métis were explicitly, in terms of their implementation, explicitly excluded from all Canadian policy to deal with land grievances. Mm -hmm. So this is all part of that that history of exclusion, that history of being ignored, that has really come, it's, it's caught up with our country. And I think the fact that these things, the Daniels decision, the Isaac Accord, is all happening around the same time as Canada is really embracing the Truth and Reconciliation, or some of Canada is really embracing the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's final report and those calls to action, I think is really interesting and it's really important. Um, I guess what I would leave with you is, um, to, st to stress that um, 
we can't forget the Métis. We can't forget the Métis Nation in that work. Um, and so I would encourage you, as you're writing your papers, as you're in your classes, as you're teaching your classes, um, in your job, in your, in your work, to be really mindful and ask the question, always ask the question, are we dealing with, are we recognizing um, and being respectful of the Métis Nation in all the work that you're doing? Is that a question? Yes. Um, thanks so much for your talk. I, my question is about um, the vision for self-government mm -hmm. moving forward, uh, especially as you just laid out with the erosion historically of the Métis land base and sort of what sort of jurisdictions are hoped for in, in entering into these negotiations? I think that when we get to the point of actually formally negotiating self-government, um, everything is going to be on the table. So, and this is one of the things that created a lot of confusion around the Manitoba Métis Federation case. It was framed as a land claim and it freaked a lot of people out because they thought, oh my God, the Métis want money back. Um, <laughs> and in fact, the Manitoba Métis Federation, I've said, we actually don't, this isn't, this isn't about land per se. And I think that the, the language around land claims is really, um, it can be very misleading and create a lot of confusion. But what it, but what it is about is that recognizing Métis rights and then finding, finding ways that are appropriate to figure out how do, we, how do we affect reconciliation with regard to those. So I think that um, a land base is incredibly important and I think that that's, that's one of the things that Métis people share with other Indigenous peoples. Our connection to the land really lies at the heart of who we are. In Ontario we've been stripped of our land base. Um, and so that is something that I think would absolutely be part of what we would want to talk about. But we also, we also, I mean, there's the recognition of our government um, and respect for that process. But there are a whole host of issues. And when you think about where our, where our people are, um, and you look at what other indigenous nations have done when they've negotiated self-government, there's a whole range of issues, subject areas of, of jurisdiction that are on the table. And it would be no different for us. Our story is different. We're not talking about a discrete little land base, like a, like a reserve or a defined, a really closely defined, because if we wanted to sit down and really talk about what our traditional territory is, it covers the vast majority of, uh, of Ontario, at least sort of the, the lower two-thirds of Ontario. So it's a, it's a very, I think it's going to be a, a very different sort of an approach. And I think that's one of the things that, um, that I don't, we're not going to get hung up on, and this isn't about we want what they have. This isn't about we want the exact same things that First Nations or Inuit have. And in fact, I think that uh, we need to look at those things and understand those things. It's about being treated equitably. And it's about being treated with respect. And I think with regard to the Métis, um, we're going to have to find um, the Métis way of addressing those things. Our issues, there's a lot of our issues are really quite similar to First Nations. Um, but there are some things where there's quite a bit of difference. The land base issue is an area where there's quite a bit of difference. When we start looking at those um, sort of those social indicators, um, you know, one of the things that, that Tom Isaac said in his report is that basically on all those socioeconomic indicators, the Métis fall short uh, against as compared to other Canadians. Um, we've done some work in Ontario um, specific, for example, to health. And this is one of the challenges, right? When we look at statistics, for example, the data that we have in Canada around Métis people, they're non-existent because government actually doesn't even do a good job of tracking Aboriginal people. So when you start to say, well, what are the needs of Métis people? There's just nothing there. So we've started to do that work ourselves. So we're working, for example, in the area of health, we're working with the Institute for Clinical and Evaluative Studies to do, and, and health researchers, to look at the specific health needs of Métis, our citizens within Ontario. We're going to be doing similar things in the area of justice. Um, we're continually doing those things in the area of education and training. But we know that our people um, are suffer, disproportionately suffer uh, poverty. We know that there are enormous health risks. We're at, we're at increased, it was actually really depressing when we did the health research because it's chronic disease, cancer. Um, we are at an increased risk across the board. And in fact, in a couple of areas, we're even at a higher risk than First Nations in Ontario. So those social indicators, um, really, you can see how this history of dispossession, this history of being driven off the land, of being stripped of those resources, have, and, and Canada's history of colonization and colonialist policy, um, you know, we've been impacted by all of those things. 
but we haven't we haven't had the resources. We haven't we haven't had the land base. We haven't had the federal re recognition. And while I know that all those things that First Nations have, uh, having worked with a First Nation, I can tell you it's not all that in a bag of chips. Like there's huge problems. Uh, like they're <coughs> completely, grossly inadequate. But when you're standing on the outside and you're not even getting those things, you're not even getting into those doors, um, there's, um, the Métis have been impoverished in terms of how Canada um, has approached that. And so we're going to be talking about all of those areas and figuring out a way forward. What I can tell you, one of the things you'll see on the cover of the Voyager that I handed out, we've appointed an MNO Commission on Métis Rights and Self-Government. And so we've, we've appointed seven of our citizens, um, including our youth, to actually talk with citizens. We're going to be, this is my life over the next few months, we're going to be going into every single one of our communities to talk about, to have this conversation, to talk about self-government and where it is that we see ourselves moving forward. And that's been, the, the thing that drives us in everything that we do is our statement of prime purpose. That was developed by our citizens when MNO was created. Um, and that statement of prime purpose and that goal, that ultimate goal, one of the great lines in it is, guided by our spiritual values, we aspire to achieve our highest potential. We've set out a whole range of objectives. Those are the things, and you, so I encourage you to take a look at those and read through them, but those are the things that we're looking at. How can we be self-sufficient? How can we have healthy, thriving communities? How can we ensure that our children and our young people have the opportunity to be everything that they want to be, that they can be? Those, those are the issues that we'll be talking about. Yeah. Great. Um, so, you got we'll like give you an opportunity, the students, some of the students have to go to class. I appreciate it. So, I'm actually going to say, first of all, I have an easy help, so I'm going to stay. Thank President Crow. <laughs>